Hey, welcome to a special edition of the Give Me Liberty podcast here at the Standing for Freedom Center at Liberty University. And I'm joined by a very special guest, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. Welcome. It's good to be back here on this campus. And uh, in the past eight or nine years, I'm just blown away by the incredible explosion here and the new facilities. Beautiful campus. God's doing some amazing things yes, he on is. Liberty Mountain. I... Um, I just wanted to first, you know, it's it's one of those things when, when you go on the news, oftentimes it's talking about policies and politics, and those are all important, and we'll get to that. But I wanted to first just do give us a little download of your background and sure. your faith, because I think that's something our audience would love to hear about. Well, I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, went to the University of Tennessee. Uh, my father challenged me at the age of 15 to be the first officer in our family because he was enlisted in World War II, and my older brother enlisted in uh, Vietnam, Marine Corps. Everyone has a black sheep of the family, so that was ours. Uh, but uh, after that, did 22 years uh, in service in the United States Army, uh, three different combat zones, uh, Desert Show Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan. I've uh, been married for 33 years, an incredible woman. Uh, she has a PhD. She's a brilliant uh, you know, professional and wealth management advisor. We have two daughters, 29, 26, and a grandson, 21 months. And I will tell you that I came to faith in the Lord while I was a freshman at University of Tennessee in 1980, January, uh, because I was always brought up in the church and everything. But you've got to make that commitment yourself. Uh, it's an individual, you know, statement and profession of faith, and that's what I made then. And I've just always tried to walk hand in hand with the Lord. But most importantly, most importantly, be his obedient servant. And I think that's what we need now in uh, the United States of America. We need the body of Christ to be obedient servants and to do his will and not try to conform to the will of the the, the society and the culture. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. I, I can't help but uh, point out, so my wife is actually from the Knoxville area, oh, Sevierville yeah. and Gallagher. Yeah, no She's a huge Vol fan. Me too. Uh, so there you go. But we love the Flames also oh, here, yeah. here at Liberty. Well, maybe but one day Liberty and Tennessee will play, and hopefully I don't upset us. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. You we, never know. We, we, we did that with Arkansas. I know. It's cool. I know. I watched that. <laughs> So I noticed your socks when we were getting yes. ready. Blessed is, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Psalm the people 12. he has chosen for his uh, inheritance. So, you know, I, I think about uh, where we are as a country. Uh, obviously, we had a unique founding, an extraordinary founding. Uh, you, you think about the first great awakening that was the precursor uh, to the American Revolution. Pastors had a special place of prominence in our culture and in society. Now, you think about where we are uh, when it comes to the faith, when it comes to speech, uh, it's almost as if you're treated as a second-class citizen. Yes. Uh, there was something even more recent. We had a Liberty University student uh, who was in Washington, D.C. during the March for Life, and uh, she was instructed by a security guard at a National Archive Museum to take off the hat. her shirt. Oh, okay, the shirt, because I heard about the hat yeah, also. The hat, shirt, any speech for pro-life. Yeah. Here we are, you know, it's 2023, hard to say that. Uh, what do you see as most needed for Christians mm -hmm. in this country today? Well, first and foremost, they have to be bold and they have to stand on the Word of God. And we need to have the pastors that will do that as well, because right now the conflagration we have is between ideological rights and constitutional rights. And when you are being told that you cannot wear a certain hat or a certain T-shirt that expresses your belief in your faith, well, the first four is that's a violation of two parts of the First Amendment, freedom of religion and free exercise thereof and the freedom of expression. But yet I'm sure that, uh, you know, someone could have walked in advocating for murdering unborn babies in the womb t-shirt or something along that lines, it would have been perfectly fine. We've got to get government back in that restraining box of the Constitution. We cannot have government supporting uh, the censorship of individual thought, uh, you know, perspectives and insights that don't go along with the political narrative. Uh, and I think that the the, the church has to play an important part of that. Because again, you know, I just share with uh, one of the classes here, Romans 12 too, it talks about we're supposed to not conform to the world. We're supposed to transform it through the renewing of our minds. And so it's a duty and responsibility that we have every single day. Uh, because right now, I think what you see happening is 
the secular humanists, the progressive socialists who are trying to push our Judeo-Christian faith heritage, which is integral to the foundation and the fundamental principles of this nation, they're trying to push it out of the marketplace. They're trying to push it back into the catacombs. And we cannot allow that to happen. So it, it is incumbent upon Christians to basically stand up. Absolutely. That's what we're supposed to do. I mean, you know, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, he didn't say, you know, you guys got to go hide. You know, Matthew talks about us being the salt and, and the light. Salt is a preserving uh, entity, and, and that's what, that was why it was so important. It, the country, the state of America right now is a direct relation to the state of the church because the church has lost a little bit of its salt and its flavor, and therefore you cast it out if it cannot do its job of preserving this constitutional republic. And that doesn't mean that we're sitting here talking about a theocracy, because that's what the left will say. Right. You want to you know, govern us by the Bible. No. But the precepts and the principles of the Bible, the Ten Commandments, are a part of the establishment of really our basis of law. Yeah. in this country. So we've got to keep that in the marketplace. They're inextricably linked. You can't totally. pull them out. Right? You know, when you are in the, the, the chamber of the House of Representatives, the People's House, and all across the, uh, the, uh, the upper balcony area there, they have the faces of all the great lawgivers of the world. But every single face is a side face except for one. There's only one face that looks at the president when they're giving the State of the Union address, the Speaker House, and that's the face of Moses. So what does that tell you? that this is part of our fabric of who we are. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I wanna shift back to faith and talk a little bit about adversity. Mm. Uh, for our students, you know, they're young, they're, they're, they're being trained up to be champions for Christ. Yes. That's our motto here at Liberty University. What, is there a key moment maybe you could look back on in your life where your faith was challenged, might even have raised questions for you oh, sure. that you had to overcome. Oh, sure. You know, uh, a lot of people probably remember the, uh, the action that I took in Iraq as a battalion commander when, you know, I fired my service 9 millimeter pistol over the head of a, an Iraqi policeman uh, because he was not forthcoming with information about ambushes and attacks against our troops. And I reported myself. And, I, you know, it went to a, a grand jury hearing, which you call Article 32, uh, and I was facing eight years mm -hmm. uh, to go to Fort Leavenworth. But when I took off and left Atlanta to go to my first duty assignment at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, my dad, who was a World War II veteran, said one thing. He said, Lieutenant, you must always make sure you take care of your men. You take care of your men, everything will fall into place. And that was something that resonated with me. And so when I think about uh, John 15, 13, where it says there's no greater love than you have to, to lay down your life for others, you know, I laid down my career to make sure that my men were safe and protected. And even though I was facing, you know, this prison sentence, I w was going to stand by. And I never thought when I was on the stand and I was asked a question, you know, now that you have seen all that has happened, with you taking this action, if we could replay this, would you do it again? And I said, you know, if it's about the lives and safety of my men, I'll go through hell with a gasoline can. I did not realize that was going to be that moment because here was a guy that's been wearing a uniform since he was 15, high school junior ROTC, battalion commander in combat. And now all of a sudden that's taken away from you and you're sitting there facing eight years in prison for taking an action to protect your troops. And I just turned it over to the Lord and said, whatever you wish to come out of this, let it be for the elevation of you and your kingdom and let this be a moment where you shine and, and my faith can shine through, you know, from you through to others. And that changed my, my path. Uh, I became an, a national figure because of that. And so I'm very, you know, Understanding, as it says in Romans 5, 3 through 5, that trials and tribulations produces the perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. You know, James in chapter 1 says, count it all joy mm. when you come to these trials and tribulations. And, and that's what we have to do. And so my message to the students out there and to everyone in the body of Christ, don't look for what's easy. Look for what's hard. Because that is how God will strengthen you. And he says, you know, be strong and of good courage. For Lord thy God, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Mm. Amen. Amen. Uh, by the way, James, one of my favorite books. Yeah. And uh, it's so that we may be made complete. Complete. Count it all joy mm -hmm. when you face trials of many kinds. Um, so I, 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 think of, I think about 
what's happening right now in our military. Oh, it's horrific. It's an, there's like an ideological purge mm -hmm. that's taking place, that they're reshaping how these young Americans think about their country. Um, you have to swear to uphold the Constitution against enemies foreign and, and domestic. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though that's not the, the main part of training anymore. It's, it's, not. it's, it's, it's about wokeism. It is. It's about this cultural Marxism. And how can you have an effective fighting force if you're telling you because of your skin color, you're an oppressor, and me because of my skin color, I'm oppressed. And you will always be perpetually wrong, evil, what have you. How, how can you and I be in a foxhole together mm. and be that, that fighting force if you are pitting us against each other? And so that's why you see the levels of recruitment and retention suffering, because we don't have a military that's focused on their primary duty and mission and responsibility, which is to protect this country and fight its conflicts and win. Uh, when you look at what is coming down from this administration and all this wokeism and all this focus on gender dysphoria, you, you know, the American Psychiatric Association said that gender dysphoria is a mental condition. Mm. OK, this is this is not the, the religion of the left is a mental condition. And so why are we now allowing people into our military with a mental condition? When we kick people out, we don't allow people to come to the military because they have flat feet. But now all of a sudden we're supposed to use taxpayer dollars to fund, you know, this condition or, you know, the secretary of defense, Lloyd Austin, sent out a letter recently and said that female troops have to be prepared for biological males to be in the shower with them. That's not your duty. That's not the mission of the military. And so you see the degradation of our capability and capacity. And right now the number one geopolitical foe that we have is China. And the means by which a country extends is hegemonic power, dominance, whatever you want to call it, is through a strong navy. Well, China has a larger surface uh, vessel fleet than we have in our navy. and But yet, our navy can tell you about proper pronouns. Mm. Or the Air Force at the academy, they're being told you can't say mom or dad. And the Marines are being told now that maybe they shouldn't say sir or ma'am. Now, what does that have to do with the readiness of our military? And so it is very troubling to me to see what is happening because this, this ideology, and, and really it is a religion of the left, it is taking over every single aspect of our culture and our society and our government. Yeah, I, I, I think about not only the external part, the external part of China is very scary, but the internal part is we're losing our virtue, we're losing yes. our morals, we're becoming corrupt from within, yeah. and we're no longer tr we can no longer trust one another, even as Americans. I think about where we were on uh, 2001, 9/11. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were united as a country that day. Uh, overwhelmingly, the Senate Republicans and Democrats were singing "God Bless America." Mm -hmm. I don't know if we could do that again in 2023. And you know what else was interesting about uh, the aftermath of September 11th? The, the place where everyone wanted to go was to the church. Mm. But yet, when we go into the crisis of COVID, the first thing the government wants to shut down is the church. The church. So that tells you everything that this place where everyone wanted to go to in 2001 because the, the, the evil that attacked us, all of a sudden now we have made the church the evil that we want to keep away from people. When we are going out there saying that pastors, even if you have service in a parking lot and people are sitting in their own cars, we're going to fine you for that. And we're going to take down the license plates of the people that are there in the parking lot and we're going to, you know, find them. We may even arrest them. That's a complete violation of our very first liberty that we have, which is the freedom of religion and free exercise thereof. So what we see happening is the secular humanists are trying to undermine everything about the omnipotence and the omniscience of the creator God. You know, if God can't get Adam and Eve, male and female, you know, two genders right, then how can he get this whole inalienable rights thing right? You know, life, liberty, property, pursuit of happiness, whatever. You know, if God, you know, he, he doesn't have anything to do with weather. You know, it's, it's about man-made climate change. And we can change the climate as long as you, you know, you know, go buy a green vehicle, which most of us cannot afford. Right. But but these are the ways that the lack of focus on our faith is affecting the policies that are coming out that are undermining the foundation of our nation. So here coming up, uh, the president is expected to sign uh, a treatise with the World Health Organization. Totally wrong. And 
It, totally wrong. WHO is a client of China. organization of China. So you're mentioning COVID, and one of the policies was church is not essential. By the way, the Freedom Center launched a campaign um, surrounding John MacArthur, James Coates, and other uh, pastors. James Coates is actually a Canadian pastor to open the churches. Church is essential. And um, we don't ultimately, Caesar has no say in this matter because it's our, our edict, our standing order is with our commander in chief, who is right. God. Right. Um, but how do you see that playing out? If the WHO is, is running our COVID policy or our response to really just medical freedom. Say no. States have to say no. Counties have to say no. Because first and foremost, it's unconstitutional. This goes back to the exact same thing, what you saw with, uh, Barack Obama with the, uh, Paris Climate Accords. Uh, treaties have to be ratified in the Senate. Uh, and you just cannot sign this thing and say, you know, we are now subservient and we're going to send taxpayer dollars as part of this. And that's why Donald Trump was able to revoke it, because it really is just an executive order. And the same thing with this. And that's why elections have consequences. And so it's so important that we win back the, uh, the White House and then say, no, WHO, you have no part in defining medical freedom or emergency medical policy in the United States of America. We're a sovereign nation. And again, this is something that we're up against, this globalist, secular, humanist idea. And when people want to tell me that, you know, the Super Bowl commercials, Jesus gets us, you know, he ain't supposed to get us. We're supposed to get him. Mm, and amen. when you're sitting down and you're trying to compare the issue of illegal immigration to Jesus, Joseph, and Mary going to Egypt— you know, to escape, you know, the decree of killing the firstborn. Well, guess what? They went back. Yeah. Okay. And, and so you cannot make that comparison, but yet that's what's happening. And so we have to protect our sovereignty. And even in Genesis, you know, God outlined the boundaries of Israel. And there's still the boundaries of, of today, which, again, you see world organizations and others trying to undermine. So we have got to get back to those fundamentals. And this nation was established on those principles, and we cannot make ourselves subservient to some secular humanist organization, which is the United Nations. And I will tell you that right now, if I were the president of the United States of America, I'm gone. I'm out of the United Nations. If you want to have Russia and China part of the uh, permanent uh, select com uh, committee on uh, security, I don't want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. If you want to you know, go out and allow these countries in to violate human rights and, and, and things, I don't want to be a part of it. So I think that that's another one of the big important decisions we have to make. Final question. One of the initiatives here at the Freedom Center is our Freedom Voters Project. Mm -hmm. And what we do is basically we inform pastors. We don't endorse candidates, but no. we enforce, we basically in, um, uh, inform pastors, churches on these issues, what they need to be in terms of understanding what policies are coming forth and um, to be educated on them, and then also how to vote. Yeah. Because we're understanding now that there's not just an election day, there's an election season. Yes. And a lot of times uh, churches become that gathering point, not just on Sunday, but other times of the week. Uh, pastors are also trusted uh, to to even be a, a, a collection point for votes that, yes. that actually happen in California. Yeah. Why is it so important that Christians uh, are educated about voting? Well, you know, I'm the national spokesperson for My Faith Votes, and it is critical that the body of Christ gets engaged because the next thing you know, you're being told your church can't be open by the people that you allow to be elected and be in electoral uh, uh, dominant or positions of, of, of governance over you. So we need to study and understand these different issues and the taxation issue. You know, yes, render under Caesar what is Caesar, but you cannot use the tax code as a weapon of mass destruction. You cannot target it against certain people. And I just share with the class here about Frederick Bastiat and uh, his essay, The Law, which that's goes into legal plunder. And so Christians need to understand their place. And so many times folks refer to Romans 13 saying that Christians are supposed to be subject to government. Christians are supposed to be subject to righteous governance, not just any government. Uh, because when you remove that qualifier, then you get 
the Hugo Chavez's, then you get the, the Hitler's, the Mussolini's, and all of the other dictators, theocrats, and autocrats. So we've got to get engaged and understand this is 24-7, 365. There's not an election season. There's a continuation, and we have to find that steady state of engagement, and pastors have got to address these issues from the pulpit. Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, thank you so much it's my pleasure. for joining us. Thank you.